come back from Athens today, and my, one of my books on basic income has just been published in Greek. And I did a public event in the center of Athens, and hundreds of people came, which is strange enough in these times. My discussant was uh, Yanis Varoufakis, and we were talking afterwards about uh, my books and the relevance, I think, to understanding what is happening in the global economy. So what I'm going to do in the next few minutes, and hopefully leave enough time for Q&A and a broad discussion, Olan was saying before we started that one of the joys he's getting at the moment is that suddenly you're interacting with people rather than with screens. Well, this afternoon we're interacting with screens again, but I'm sure you all want to, to, to sort of, you know, start participating more between yourselves. Now, I've written this book called The Precariat, and I've got a copy. It's the, the fifth edition has just, just come out. And I wrote it in 2011 the first edition. And on page one, I said that unless people come to terms and understand the precariat, unless politicians start addressing the concerns of the precariat, we will see the emergence of a political monster. And it, the book has been translated into 23 languages. And you will not be surprised that in November 2016, I received a lot of emails from around the world saying, your monster has arrived, basically, words to that effect. And we are very fortunate in a sense that we've just avoided having a second term of Donald Trump. Donald Trump represents a horrifying neo-fascist version of populism. And had it not been for COVID, the, the awful thought should strike all of us, is that he could well have won the presidential re-election last year. And even then, even though he had been disgustingly dishonest, he'd led a, a terrifying uh, non-campaign against COVID, even then he got 48% of the American votes in that presidential election. And that should make all of us feel very uneasy indeed. Now, what I want to talk about is the economic context. As I understand it, most of you are not economists as such, but I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, economics and have studied some economics. And the book that I want to base the talk on is, is just been mentioned, The Corruption of Capitalism. A new version has just come out, and, and I'm going to be addressing that book. I want to make the contextual introductory point is that the COVID pandemic was the trigger of an economic collapse but not the cause of the economic crisis that we're going to be experiencing over the next few years. If you look at the Spanish flu, which took place in 1918-1920, far more people died from the Spanish flu than will have died from COVID, even though COVID's killing huge numbers. Far more people died in the Spanish flu. And yet there was not an economic slump or an economic crisis due to the Spanish flu that is associated and will be associated with COVID. And that is because the economic system was incredibly fragile at the beginning of last year. It was, in a sense, verging towards a transformational crisis. And the context that we have to think about public policy in the next few years is really going back to a model that is most represented by Karl Polanyi's great transformation. 
I'm, all, I'm sure all of you are familiar with his thesis and his book of 1944. Essentially, he said that the 19th century was dominated by financial capital. And financial capital pursued a laissez-faire free market economic system. And in the process, economic inequalities, economic insecurity multiplied until there was a stage where was, there was a threat of the annihilation of civilization because the system had become so disgustingly uh, repressive. And of course, it ushered in Bolshevism and fascism and the Second World War. Now, Polanyi said there was a disembedded phase dominated by financial capital, and he essentially said there would be a re-embedded phase whereby the state would bring control of the economy back into society and thereby reduce those inequalities and insecurities. That was welfare state capitalism to the main after the Second World War. And we had a period where there appeared to be a great transformation in his terms. But that great transformation broke down in the 1970s, 1980s, and we had the beginnings of what I've called a global transformation. And that global transformation initially was dominated by a new hegemonic economic system, which we now call neoliberalism. Sometimes it was called the Washington Consensus, the Chicago School of Law and Economics, and so on, dominated by political leaders like Thatcher and Reagan, and the Mont Pelerin Society, which had been nurturing the tenets of this neoliberalism since it was set up in 1947, right the way through into the 1970s. When I was a student at Cambridge, we regarded those members of the Mont Pelerin Society as a bunch of right-wing nutcases who were part of history. We didn't take them very seriously. But, but in the course of the 1970s and 1990s, no less than eight of the 36 original members of the Mont Pelerin Society has got Nobel Prizes in economics. And the rest became household names within the economic system. Many went on to become prime ministers, presidents, finance ministers, etc. So it became a dominant theme. And the idea essentially was individualism, markets, dismantling institutions of social solidarity, because they were impediments to a market clearing system. That's that's the underlying neoliberalism was this anti-institutional bias. Now, my thesis of this book is that we have moved through that neoliberalism and it is no longer a neoliberalism today. It's still used in academics, in po popular commentaries, in media and so on. Everyone says it's a neoliberal age, so and so on. They always referring to Foucault and, and so on. But my thesis is that phase has passed and we have morphed into a period of rentier capitalism. And what that means is that actually more and more of the income and wealth and power goes to the owners of assets, owners of property, physical property, financial property, and intellectual property. And the big lie told by politicians and too many economists, I'm afraid to say, is that they have created a free market economy and they want to create a free market economy. Essential hypothesis in the book is this is the most unfree market economy that has ever been constructed. And the first key contextual point is that what was called the Big Bang of the 1980s was financial market liberalization, declaring that 
there should be deregulation of finance. And finance has become the power across the world to such an extent that basically independent central banks, institutions of finance have become awesomely powerful. I just give you a couple of examples. When the, in the 1960s and 1970s, banks used to account for a few percentage points of GDP. Today, in many countries, they account for multiple amounts of the national GDP. So in my own country of Great Britain, financial assets of financial institutions are worth over 1,000% of GDP, of national income. You're in Germany. In Germany, it's nearly 500%. Okay? And in many other countries, it's there or thereabouts. This is an incredible change that has taken place. And the financial system has become increasingly concentrated. The theme of the book is, is what I've called Goldman Sachsism. If you look around the world and you do a, an account of who is in what top positions, finance ministers, prime ministers, head of central banks, you name it, all the top positions, and you look at their previous career, they were all working in Goldman Sachs. It's an extraordinary reality. And, uh, you know, it's the same in Germany, it's the same in Britain, it's the same in Spain. It, you'll find that they're alumni of Goldman Sachs. It's extraordinary, extraordinary. But there's something new recently because meanwhile, as finance has been gaining strength and power and influence, we've seen a new set of asset managers rising. And the biggest of all is now BlackRock. And BlackRock, I happen to have a debate with its founder and chief executive at, at, at Davos, and he's worth a lot more than I am. And he was basically, has become the wealthiest person in the world because he commands the assets of over 20% of all stocks and shares of the world. And his algorithm box, black box, which is called Aladdin, and I discuss it in the book, basically is an algorithm that none of us can understand, but is controlling the world's stock exchange prices. You're seeing asset bubbles and, and all of the things that you read about, but it's incredibly concentrated. And the interesting thing was that when, when there was a change of the US president, very symbolically or more than symbolically, very importantly from a political point of view, whereas under Trump and under Clinton and under Obama, all his top people had been Goldman Sachs, under Biden, three of the top four economic positions in the administration are people, executives from BlackRock, the other ones from Goldman Sachs. So you see this domination of finance, which is an enormous change. And meanwhile, private equity has become awesomely powerful, and it's, it's, a, it's a sense of termite capitalism. Private capital, private equity, they buy up corporations, they do asset stripping, declare bankruptcy, maximize short-term profits, and then move on. It's called termite capitalism by some, and it is essentially that. So finance is increasingly short-term, increasingly looking for maximizing short-term profits and creating a bubble system where asset prices go up and up and up. Meanwhile, the functional distribution of the income in country after country becomes more and more unequal. 
In other words, a rising share of national income goes to the financiers and asset holders, and a declining percentage goes to people who rely on work and labor for their incomes. And this has produced what I've called the, well, not, not only I, by others as well, the jaws of the snakes. When I was a student, if profits went up, wages went up. Now, just like the jaws of snakes, you know, the top jaw opens and the bottom jaw goes down. When profits go up, average wages tend to go down. When I was a student, if I said you could have a situation where uh, if employment went up, wages would go down, I think I would have failed the exams because they would say, no, no, it doesn't work. The economy doesn't work like that. But that's how it's doing these days. So in many countries, when employment goes up, average wages are going down. That didn't used to happen. The same with the growth of productivity. When product, it used to be when productivity went up, wages went up, average wages went up. No longer the case. So you, you are having an economic system that has become quite uh, dramatically different from the past. Meanwhile, there have been monopolistic trends. It used to be the case that prices versus production costs were slightly higher, okay? So that, for example, the markups in the 1980s of prices over costs would be about 20%. Now, in most countries, it's over 60%. And in many countries and many firms and court sectors, it's gone six-fold increase. So you have a dramatic increase in monopolization, basically linked to financial controls. And one thing I'm about to talk about, but essentially what this means is in sector after sector, we've seen greater monopolization, whereas the neoliberals said, we'll say the opposite, because competition will whittle away monopolies, but that's not what's been happening. So what's happened is, in fact, is that more and more conglomerations have taken place. And this is linked to the biggest lie of all among economists and politicians. Because what has happened is the intellectual property rights system has fundamentally changed. Since the passage of TRIPS, which was the trade-related aspects of intellectual property passed by the World Trade Organization in 1994. And it's very ironic because this is essentially a globalization of the US intellectual property rights system. And it was led by a group of US multinationals headed by none other than Pfizer. And what they did essentially in 1994 under TRIPS is they globalized the system whereby patents are increasingly common. A patent means that anybody holding a patent or filing a patent has a monopoly income profit for 20 years. And in the case of pharmaceuticals, with what's called evergreening, it could be extended for another 20 years. And now we have in the world fit over 15 million patents in place, which is in guaranteeing non-market systems because they are guaranteed monopoly. Nobody can produce something if somebody else has a patent. And many patents are for publicly researched and publicly funded research. So they can't be saying it's a reward for taking risks. It's us who take the risks. And many patents are taken out by corporations, not because they want to produce with that patent, but to stop anybody producing. So the, in addition to patents, you have copyright. Copyright used to be for 14 years. In other words, if you had copyright on something, you had any income flowing from that copyright for 14 years, and it was extended to 28. Now, as a result of TRIPS, 
copyright applies to anything that you copyright for the whole of your life plus 70 years i don't know what you're going to do with the money but it, but but in other words you have a monopoly income flow and copyrights extended to so many things same with industrial brands and other aspects of intellectual property. And what the IP system has done is increased the concentration of production and the inequality that I was talking about earlier. At the same time, country after country has become what I would call neo-mercantilist which means that basically they want their national champions, their big corporations, their household name corporations, to become dominant in the world. And therefore, governments give those corporations and those interests huge subsidies. On average, governments give corporations 5% of GDP, in some countries much more than that, to big corporations, and they could be giving it to low-income people, but you know they can't afford to give it to low-income people because they're giving it to big corporations. And the subsidies are distortions of a dramatic kind. This is not a free market economy at all. It's not at all. Now, the big thing that's happened as a result of rentier capitalism is that we've had a huge increase in debt. Increase in government debt, increase in corporate debt. The time of the Spanish flu, there was no corporate debt in the United States and many other countries, so that they could ride, they could ride the storm, as it were. Today, corporate debt comes to 90% of GDP in many countries. It's extraordinary. But of course, household debt, primary private debt is a multiple of GDP in many countries. So imagine what happens in an economic system, you get a downturn. And if you've got millions of people and millions of corporations, thousands of corporations, on the edge of debt, they are extremely fragile, it, it could all unfold and collapse. So governments then resort to quantitative easing and propping up the banks, propping up corporations, giving more subsidies to keep the system ticking along. And that's basically what's been happening. Now, you mentioned at the beginning the book Plunder of the Commons. I wrote that book, and it's, it's, what, it's, it's something that I, it's personal to me because I, I really learned a lot in, in writing about it and thinking about it. But if you think about any society, be it Germany or anywhere else, the commons are part of our heritage. Not only the land, the sea, the water, the air, but the social amenities, the social facilities built up over generations. And we inherit that and it gives us our culture, our base, and it's part of us. But what's happened in this period is the privatization and neo-colonial control of our commons. Country after common, I just mentioned Greece, when they got into their financial difficulties, Yanis was relating to me last night all the problems they, they had in 2015 when he was finance minister, when basically the IMF and the Troika and your wonderful finance minister Schwab basically said, you have to sell off all those assets. You have to sell off islands. You have to sell off the Parthenon. You have to do this, that, and the other. But what was dramatically disgusting in Greece has been happening in a different form elsewhere as well. We have seen an erosion of our commons. And that is one of the reasons why I believe we should be demanding a revival of the commons and using it for paying for a basic income, and I'll leave that aside for the moment. Now, the crucial story of the emergence of rentier capitalism, which is where I hope some of you who are working, maybe doing a PhD or master's thesis or whatever, 
can focus on because we still need a lot of good research and political activism around it is a new global class structure has taken place. And that global class structure has a plutocracy at the top. It's not a top 1%. It's a 0.001% of billionaires who are global citizens. And underneath them is an elite of multimillionaires serving, serving the interests of finance and so on. And underneath that is a salariat. Many of you and no doubt me, when I was doing graduate studies, would have expected to, or would expect to go into the salariat. And it was expected when I was doing labor economics a long time ago, that more and more people would move into the salariat. What I mean by that is that they would have employment security, they would have a career in a corporation or in an occupation, they would have access to a pension, to paid benefits, a regular salary, etc. etc. But of course, globally, that class is shrinking. And more and more of people in that class are expecting that their children will not be entering the salaria. They'll be coming to what I'm coming to in a moment. Underneath the salariat in, in average income terms is the old proletariat, for which the welfare states, social policy, public policy that you're studying was built after the Second World War. But the proletariat was supported by the social democrats, by the trade unions and so on, collective bargaining, tripartism, international labor organization, and its conventions and so on, that model of social democracy ceased to be progressive back in the 60s or 70s. My thesis includes the, the critique of social democrats because social democrats are holding up a discredited system and nobody's taking them very seriously. You might see a social democrat victory in Germany, but it's basically a, a, a dead men walking mostly men, it turns to be, but social democracy was progressive in the early part of the last century, but today is holding up a, a progressive uh, realignment of political action and economic reform. And I developed that theme in, in the books. That proletariat is shrinking and the precariat underneath is growing. And the precariat can be defined in class terms as having three dimensions. And however many times I say what I'm about to say, there will be someone who'll go out and say, well, standing is saying the precariat is defined by having insecure, precarious work. I want to say that that is not the case, okay? It is the case that if you're in the precariat, you're likely to have unstable, insecure labor, all, all the statuses we know about, living bits and pieces lives, having no occupational narrative, no corporate narrative to give yourselves, <clears throat> having an education that's higher than the level of job you're likely to get. That's, that's obvious. But it's also true that the precariat has to rely almost exclusively on money wages. It doesn't get access to non-wage benefits and it doesn't get access to rights-based state benefits. And this is the first mass class in history which is being exploited as much through debt mechanisms as through wage mechanisms. That is what defines it in really critical terms so that basically finance wants all of us to be in debt. They want, if finance wants every single one of you, and me included, to have a life of being in debt because that's where they make their money. Not surprising, okay? But we shouldn't be allowing them to do that, but that's what they would like to do and they're doing it very well. But the third dimension is most critical for the, anybody who wants to be focusing on public policy. And that is, this is a class that is in the process of losing rights of citizenship. They are increasingly denizens, 
even within their own society, not just migrants who are in, in the precariat, but everybody who's in the precariat. They're losing civil rights, that's equal access to justice. They're losing political rights. They don't see in the political system politicians and political strategies for them and their, their class and interests. They're losing economic rights because they cannot practice what they want to practice and have to do things they don't want to do. And they're losing cultural rights. And this sense of losing rights goes with what I say is the decisive defining aspect of being in the precariat. And that is people feel like a supplicant. They feel they have to rely on favors. They feel they have to rely on discretionary judgments, be it by bureaucrats, by landlords, by parents, by teachers, by employers. They have to, and that's the original Latin derivation, they have to obtain by prayer. And this, this class at the moment, if in Marxian terms, is a class in the making, not yet a class for itself, in the sense that it is internally divided. And the old part of the precariat and the lesser educated part basically feel they've lost what they had yesterday. And they become atavistic and they want to bring back yesterday. That part of the precariat voted for Donald Trump, voted for Brexit, voted for the far right, Orban, you name it. But fortunately, I think their numbers are beginning to decline. The second part of the precariat are the migrants, the minorities, many women, many people with disabilities who don't have a sense of the presence, don't have a now, don't have a home. I call them the nostalgics. And the third part of the precariat are the young, mainly young, educated, who go to college, go to university, go to Hertie school or wherever, and basically their teachers and parents promised them if they did that, they would have a career, a future. And too many of them come out of university and they don't have a future and they know it. They know they were sold a lottery ticket. And that lottery ticket is worth less and less and their debts are mounting and they're living bits and pieces lives. That is the precariat we are, where we are today. And that precariat is looking for a new, what I've called in the books, a politics of paradise. Looking for a new progressive agenda. And that progressive agenda is something that I've developed in this small book, most recently called Battling Eight Giants. I'll conclude on that. Because the Battling of Eight Giants is taken from a reinterpretation of William Beveridge's famous report of 1942, which was taken into the post-war era as a sort of guide for developing the welfare state capitalism in Europe and elsewhere. And on page two of Beveridge's report, he said the challenge is to slay five giants. The five giants were disease, idleness, ignorance, squalor, and want. My argument is that in the development of rentier capitalism, in the development of global class structures with this precariat mushrooming everywhere, we have eight modern giants that we have to slay. And those eight modern giants are inequality, insecurity, debt, stress. We have a pandemic of stress from before the pandemic the COVID hit us, a lot of evidence of rising morbidity, deaths of despair and so on. Precarity along the lines I've just been describing, automation and the robots is the sixth giant. And it's the seventh giant, which I believe will be the tipping point for making more of us 
into rebels with a cause. And that is the threat of extinction. The pandemic is already the sixth pandemic this century. And what that pandemic represents is a huge increase in uncertainty. An uncertainty, you can't have the old welfare system. You need a new income distribution system to deal with uncertainty. And extinction is something demanding that we have high carbon taxes, demanding we have a different way of dealing with the polluters. But we can only deal with that if we provide basic security for millions and millions of people in the precariat, because otherwise they won't opt for high carbon taxes and so on. We saw that with the Gilets Jaunes, and we'll see it in other ways. And this threat of extinction, which we need to confront with the economic reforms, not blah, 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 as we're going to see in COP26 in Glasgow shortly, goes with the eighth giant, which is a threat of neo-fascist populism, which is still there. That, I think, is the biggest fear we have, that we'll have a cleverer Donald Trump emerging soon. We will have more people who manage to sell an agenda that looks attractive, but is actually authoritarian, building the panopticon society, and so on. And that, I think, is why, my concluding comments, why I found that in the past year and a half, suddenly the policy that I've been pushing for the last 30 plus years has suddenly taken on a global significance and a global support base. I've done over a hundred Zooms, a very strange thing to be doing, over a hundred Zooms in the last 18 months all about basic income. Millions of people have suddenly said, we need a basic income. And we are seeing people realizing that the resilience of all of us will depend on the resilience of the weakest members of our society. And without giving a basic income as a right, the precariat will become more and more insecure the stresses, the, all the things I talk about, those eight giants will become worse and more threatening. Basic income isn't a panacea, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it is going to have to be part of the solution. We've done pilots around the world, and one of the beautiful things is that everywhere, whatever type of experiment is being done, the first thing you see is improvement in mental and physical health. The second thing is you see more work and more of the sort of work that we would like to encourage, more care work, more voluntary work, more community work, a sort of reorientation of a way of living, which goes with being closer to nature, having ecological values. And every time I give a talk to a precariat group before the pandemic, when we talked about this subject, Precariat understands. But now, as a result of COVID, millions more are supporting. And I think that that is an encouraging thing. Of course, the financiers will resist. Of course, the right will try and make it into a way of dismantling the state and all that nonsense. They won't succeed. But it's going to be part of the agenda of a new politics of paradise. And looking at you, I genuinely say it without wishing to be remotely patronizing. I genuinely wish I were your age, being a student, whether it's in Hertie School or anywhere else, because you have the chance to make a huge structural change through the activities and the work you do. I was saying to Yanis Parafatis last night, I said, our job now is basically to say, a lot of you stand up. And basically, that's where we are today. And I, I actually very optimistic, because although this is a dark point in the tunnel, there's an energy out there that is fantastic. And, and then on that note, I'll shut up myself.
and I'll take any questions you like to throw at me. I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the presentation, Guy Sanding. Um, this is extremely captivating, uh, insightful, and thoughtful. Um, I wish we could have it in person so that we could engage in the discussion together. Um, anyone that does have questions, please just put your name in the chat or write your question in the chat. I would love to give you the opportunity to be able to um, ask the question yourself directly. Um, I see, Olan, your, your hand is up already, so maybe I can give the floor to you and you can fire away to start us off. Um, yeah, so I'll start off. Can you hear me well? Yeah, sure. All good. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much for your, uh, for your talk, Dr. Sanding. It was, yeah, really inspiring. Um, but yeah, I want to start off with a question that when you were talking about the precariat, it sort of reminded me of this quote from the British social historian E.P. Thompson, who's talking about that the working class didn't rise like the sun in the morning, it didn't rise automatically, but it was present at its own making. And what he meant by that is it expressed its agency through the labor and the working class movement and had its effect on society. So I wanna ask you, where do you see, where are you hopeful for that the precariat can have this same effect that the working class had in the 19th and the early 20th century? Where do you see this movement arising? And yeah, where are you hopeful? Um, yeah, E.P. Thompson was a great historian and he wrote this fantastic book, The Making of the English Working Class. And you're right, he, um, he focused a lot on agency. You have to remember, looking back at his work and the work of Hobsbawm and other uh, historians in the same mold as them, that it took, it took 50, maybe many more years uh, before that agency developed. Initially, the proletariat was forged uh, and it was very fragmented very lacking in agency and very much uh, regarded as a mixture of elements. In my work, I've argued that the crystallization of the proletariat in the 19th century led to a juncture where it could have gone either way. It could have gone to the point where people like William Morris and many of the more romantic socialists would have wanted it to go, which is a revival of the values of work, independence, crafts, cooperatives, guild socialists, and so on. Or it could have gone the way it did go, which it went through industrial, trade unions, labor unions, social democratic parties, labor parties, discipline, linking everything to labor. Even the communists, everything was labor. If you did labor, you were a citizen. If you didn't do labor, you were a parasite. Even some of those people that mixed with E.P. Thompson, the Fabians, for example, they were actually in favor of work labor camps the unemployed, mm -hmm. led to a juncture where the more illiberal part of laborism, tying everything to the performance of labor, took over. That resulted in women in particular becoming second class because they weren't expected to be labor, they were expected to do housework, mm -hmm. secondary workers, so had less in terms of citizenship rights. Whatever they say these days, in those days, the unions were sexist, the labor parties were sexist, and they were hierarchical, and they were basically said, put up with being in a job. We will get more of the pie, but you take that. And I think it was a historical error of wrong agency. At the moment, we're in a phase, which I hope will take much, much less time than 50 I, you know, I hope it's happening very quickly, where we're actually seeing new forms of social organization multiplying at an incredibly rapid rate. And we should all belong to different interest groups. There's a famous saying that we need as many interest groups as have, we have interests to represent. 
which is GDH coal. And that is true. And if you look around, you find there's this fantastic energy. We all should belong to organizations which are struggling for our particular agenda, be it ecological, in my case, it's our basic income movement where we have thousands and thousands of members and we have networks in 35 countries. These are the platoons, the small platoons of agency. And it will take time before it gels into a new class-based alliance, new political movements, but we need to phase out the old elephants and the old dinosaurs on the left of center, if you like, who are holding us, holding us back. That's the short answer. I, I'll give a long answer in, in, in the books. But, but to me, agency is vital. Voice in the Hirschman sense of voice. We can't, we can't have a future without voice. But I, I, I you know, it's, there's a lot of energy out there. Thank you for your answer. That was great. Thanks. So I think um, I will, I don't see any hands up and I think I'll be a bit selfish and uh, ask a question myself. Um, and that is, you, know, you briefly mentioned the, the commons and obviously you have the book, The Plunder of the Commons, and you reference certain different types of commons with which we can reclaim. And you also discussed universal basic income. And from a policy perspective, there are many different opinions as to the efficacy universal basic income can have. And one of the cr critiques that I often hear is that how can we fund this and why would it not be targeted? So if we take one element of that, which is how can we fund this or how can we maybe also um, re reclaim some portions of the common, say housing, uh, how can we finance such a, such a process? I mean, uh, for example, in Berlin here, they're currently trying to reclaim 3,000 uh, buildings. I think if, if I'm correct, it's going to be a, a referendum at the next election, whether the Senate should be able to do that. And it's quite a contentious issue. So I guess my, my question to you is, um, if there is such a window of opportunity, you know, how can you fund such a mechanism like universal basic income? And um, how do you think you can bring together the political will to actually start the process of reclaiming you know, the commons? Well, let, let, me, let me first, first of all, the book, my book on basic income uh, tries to give a lengthy answer to your, your question here. Um, I'm going to give a, a, a shorter answer. The, one of the great statements by John Maynard Keynes, who was probably the greatest economist of the 20th century, was that anything we really need, we can afford. And we really need basic security for everybody right now. In the financial crash of 2007-2008, the first thing the financial institutions did was indulge in quantitative easing, by which they poured billions and billions, hundreds of billions of euros, dollars, pounds, yen into the financial markets. Suddenly, from going to a situation where we couldn't afford things, they were finding billions of currencies of the financial institutions, quantitative ease. I did a calculation that if just a fraction of that had been spent on giving everybody a basic income, you could have provided a basic income for everybody in Europe for three or four years with the amount that they spent in the period, the same period. It's not a question of avoiding, it's, it's a question of choosing which way you expend your money. As a result of the way they did spend that money, Asset prices went up, bubbles went up, privatization of public assets increased, investment by the financiers in China went up, and inequality in Europe went up. Very, all very predictable economic outcomes. And that was actually very bad in terms of promoting regrowth too, because much of the money was flowing out of the, out of the economy. It's the same in the response to COVID. Governments and central banks have been squandering money like confetti at a wedding. They've been giving it to the finances, 
the biggest interest-free loan in by given out by the British government in last year was you some of you who are, I don't know I see any Germans here but some of you if you are German should be very happy about this because the biggest loan by far was given to BASF the biggest chemical corporation in the world who had a forecast profit of 118 billion euro for last year and yet they were given huge money to help them get over the problems of the downturn. The fellow schemes that have been spending money like confetti in propping up jobs in zombie firms is also spending money. So we'd have money in terms of allocation possibilities. But as I think you know, in my book on plunder of the commons, the last chapter is basically saying that from a long-term point of view, we should set up a commons capital fund in every country along the lines of what they've done in Norway. You don't need oil as your main source of the funds for that capital fund. Basically, you say any interest taking from the commons has to compensate every part of society through being put money being put into this fund. As the fund rises, you can pay out dividends, which is a form of, of uh, basic income, through the rising value of the fund. The Norwegian fund that started very small today means that every Norwegian is effectively a multimillionaire. It's that valuable, it's huge, but it's not, doesn't require oil. One of the ways we need to do it is we need to have high carbon tax, as I mentioned in my talk. A high carbon tax, which, which will force people to cut back on use of greenhouse gas emissions and so on. But that will only be politically feasible, as the Gilets Jaunes showed in France, if you recycle the revenue so that everybody gets that revenue back in the form of a basic income. Because otherwise it will in increase inequality. The poor person pays a higher percentage of their income than the rich person. But we don't need just carbon taxes. We need other eco taxes. We need a land value tax, which encourages more return to the commons of our land. We need to, to have levies on all uses of our commons. And I have a long set in, in that book that you've mentioned. For me, that is the best way for building up the capacity to pay. Along the Alaska Permanent Fund that was very good until the Republicans have raided it. But we, it's, it's something that requires a structural reform. And that would re reduce inequality. It would recycle the rentier income and there are various other ways. We need a digital data tax on the, 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 the Google and so on, because they are taking our commons. They are taking our information commons and turning it into vast profits illegitimately. We're being exploited without even realizing it. But we can, we can respond to that. And basically, it gets to a political question. We will only get these structural changes if we demand them. And that gets back to the first question about agency and active <laughs>